We used qualiamine in the clinical trial that we did. Uh, that was the nootropic formula that we used. And I put pretty much everyone who comes in on qualiamine right out of the gate. And then for those suffering with fatigue as well, Qualiolife is another product that I'm a big fan of. So supplementation can be one of these easy wins. Whenever people are trying to get started and they feel overwhelmed, supplementing, just swallowing some pills is pretty simple, right? Compared to changing your diet, changing your sleep habits, changing your exercise routine, just creating a little bit more nutrient resource in our bodies can be that thing that helps us to finally get the sleep that we need, right? Because I'll, I'll have this sleep conversation with people and they'll be like, I know, I get it. I know I need sleep for my brain, but I can't sleep. And it's like, okay, if we can get you the right formula, sometimes all of a sudden now you're sleeping. Now that you're waking up rested, you can make better dietary decisions. You have the energy to reach out to that friend to go for a walk. All of a sudden, you just have more resource generally. And so supplements are an easy place to start. Collective Insights is a voyage through topics and technologies revolutionizing human well-being. Groundbreaking approaches for a better world and a better life await you. Welcome to Collective Insights. Hi, Ben Angel here, long-term partner of Qualia and big fan of Collective Insights. Before today's episode, let me share why Qualia became such a respected brand for me. So I've wanted to be a successful writer ever since I was a child, but for years, my mind wasn't cooperating. It was too scattered, too unfocused, and too easily exhausted to actually buckle down and maintain the writing pace and quality of prolific authors. But in recent years, I've published three best-selling books that have transformed my life and much of the credit in my huge jump in productivity goes to Qualia Mind. Qualia Mind is the world's most advanced brain nutrition with 32 vegan, non-GMO, gluten-free ingredients packed into one serving a day with stunning support for focus, mood, memory, and what I needed, the drive to get things done. And with a 100-day money-back guarantee, there's no risk in trying the difference for yourself. Go to qualialife.com forward slash Ben Angel and use code Ben Angel for an additional 15% off your order. That's qualialife.com forward slash Ben Angel to try the ultimate blend for brain health. Hi, this is Dr. Greg, and today we have Dr. Heather Sanderson, a naturopathic doctor who's dedicated her career to supporting those suffering with dementia. She's the founder of Soul Sherry Health Clinic and Marama, the first residential care facility for the elderly of its kind. She has created unique, successful solutions for patients and caregivers using clinical, residential research and educational platforms, employing holistic and multimodal interventions. She's also a medical advisor here at Neurohacker. Heather, thank you for joining us today. Always a privilege. So for just background, Heather actually hosted Collective Insights for a couple of years, and I've told her this before, but she's my favorite host to date. So I would strongly encourage listeners, if you like listening to her today, share about her work, to go back and listen to some of the episodes she hosted for us. So that said, the main reason we have Heather back again today is to celebrate her new book launch. So congratulations, Thank you. And thank you to the whole Neurohacker team for your help getting the word out about the book launch. It's been a wild ride, but really fun. I've felt like a steward of this book. It doesn't feel like my book. It very much feels like the medicine is really Dr. Bredesen is the one who's been on the forefront of this, who's put this out into the world. And then it's the patients, the patients who have been the pioneers in this space, willing to trust us with their process, with their health, with doing the testing and guiding them in terms of what to do. And then the tireless caregivers who have been just so dedicated to their loved ones and willing to do what it takes to regain cognitive function. And so little of this belongs to me. I hope a celebration of the beginning of a movement or the progression of a movement towards letting people know that they have control over their brain health, that not only is there not nothing that you could do, to be told that like if someone tries to tell you there's nothing you can do for Alzheimer's to prevent it, to reverse it, to delay it, they that is factually inaccurate. That is no longer true. That is not correct. There's actually an overwhelming amount of things that we can do. And that's what I'm excited to talk about. Well, good. And for listeners, the book, can you share the title? Yeah, the book is called Reversing Alzheimer's, the new toolkit to improve cognition and protect brain health. 
Thanks. And I was fortunate to get a pre-publication copy and got to read it and really loved it for listeners. And as you mentioned, like it's really built on the huge amount of experience you have in this world. That's, you know, some of it's working with patients, some of it's because of working at Marama, some of it's your study, some of it's feedback and you've gotten from people that have found you on the internet or taking your courses. So can you, I'd love for you just to share some of your background and how well-rounded it is for dealing with an aging brain, particularly. Yeah, so I was naturopathic doctor. You and I are both nat- we're naturopathic colleagues. So I was trained really in our system of medicine. It is all about how can we promote health? How can we create wellness? What can we do to basically, when we think of the body as a complex system, there's lots of different inputs. And how can we systematically go through that and imagine what would create an optimally functioning cell, neuron, body, brain, right? And then how can we stack those things on top of each other? So when I was trained in naturopathic school, even though we had this conceptual framework when it came to whole body, whole, whole brain health, we were still told that there was nothing you could do for dementia or Alzheimer's. And that's what the literature suggested at that time. So I had been told, don't tell anyone there's anything you can do. That's false hope. And at this stage, that's actually been turned on its head. I think that to suggest there's nothing you can do is to promote false hopelessness. It's to create people, you know, this this feeling of hopelessness and, and that there's no agency for patients when there is so, so, so much that we can do. And so then it's just a matter of getting organized, right? And being able, getting motivated, getting organized, and then putting the information into practice. My path basically took me to Dr. Bredesen, who Daniel Schwanberger, one of the Neurohacker founders, he was very encouraging that I train with with Dr. Bredesen. When I trained with Dr. Dale Bredesen, although I had a lot of skepticism, the concepts again made sense. Okay, It was very much applying naturopathic medicine to brain health and cognition and to Alzheimer's. So then after being trained by him, I came back into my clinical practice. I had developed the clinical practice in 2017 and then was trained by him within a year after that. So immediately started seeing a lot of brain health patients, Alzheimer's patients, because I was on his list. Basically, it was marketed. His book came out. It was a New York Times bestseller. And then people were reading the book and looking for clinicians who knew how to do what he was describing. So I started seeing those patients. Was shocked, really in disbelief that we were seeing them get better. Not one or two patients, but many patients, most of our patients, and not just the patients at the early stages who maybe didn't have Alzheimer's yet, but who were just kind of starting down the path of cognitive impairment, but even people who were severely impaired were getting better. Not 100% better. I would never suggest that this was a cure, but people were making market improvements that were not only improving their own cognition, but the quality of their life, the quality of the lives of their loved ones around them. So that started happening. And then I had a little bit of a reputation in this space. So kind of simultaneously, we had my team and I had opportunities to do a trial, a clinical trial in my office where we took 25 participants through a six-month intervention. And we saw that 74% of those participants with measurable cognitive impairment improved their cognition. And then around the same time, we got the opportunity to create an immersive experience in Dr. Bredesen's approach, which is Marama. This is a residential care facility where people come and move in. I was getting phone calls from people saying, hey, my dad or my uncle or somebody in my family has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. We really want them to do this Bredesen approach, but I'm so overwhelmed. I'm in the sandwich generation that it has a full-time job. I've got kids to raise. I've got a marriage to keep together and a household to manage. I can't stop everything and take care of my dad as much as I love him, but I want him to get all of that, that the food and the, and the exercises and the social engagement, everything you guys are talking about. And so Marama was born out of those questions and those inquiries. And so now we've been there since March of 2020, and now there's another facility in Kansas. And what we're looking to do is license that model across existing senior living facilities. We feel like as a team, that's the way it's going to grow and get access to this the most expedient way possible. So that is kind of where we are with with Marama and the research has been published. I was published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease in August of 2023. And then a couple of years ago, I had this opportunity to write a book about my experience. And that came out of coaching, online coaching programs where people who, right, so people would come and they would say in the clinical practice, if I do this, if I spend the time and the money to do all of what you're saying, how likely is it that myself or my loved one will get better? And we didn't know. And that was what the clinical trial answered. 
And then people are calling and saying, hey, I really want this to happen for my loved one, but I can't do it all. So that was what Marama answered. And then once we had Marama, we only had this one facility here in San Diego. People were moving from all over the country and calling from all over the world. But then they were saying, well, I don't want I can't move from Australia or the visa issues or I can't, you know, I don't want to move from New York. I want my mom here with me, not in San Diego. And so then we said, okay, we'll do this Marama at home program. And so that was the answer to those questions. And so I just have had kind of been trying to find solutions for the constraints for different families and the different dynamics. We have modified our offerings. And in that had this just incredible opportunity to learn so much from all of these patients who, again, they are just, I, they are so brave. They, they're pioneering this. I think I feel lucky that our approach makes common sense, right? It's maybe uncommon practice, but stacking interventions, including supplementation, sleep optimization, stress management, diet and exercise, of course, when we stack all these things on top of each other, of course, most people will get healthier. But they really had just these initial people. I have so much respect and love and admiration for them because they trusted us. Like we didn't really know how it was all going to play out. And I think I'm so grateful that it's it's gone really well. Most people get better. But there were a lot of people who had to had to be the guinea pigs, had to start, had to get us started. And so I'm just so grateful to all of them. And this book is really, it's really about them and a, and a big thank you to them. Well, wow. and for listeners... The book is very much a toolkit. It's very, I would say it's solution based. The majority of the book is this like diet. This is, you know, what we do and this is how you can go about doing it. And these would be maybe the most important couple of things if you can only do a few. And one of the things I was hoping we would do today is touch on a few of the big areas and highlight, you know, one or two important things. But before we get there, I think one of the important things that you lay out early in the book is I'll just read it, but like it's your definition of model of health, the homeodynamic balance within a complex system. You shout out Daniel Smachtenberger as a mentor in that. And I remember at some point being in your office when it was an NCD desk with you and Daniel, and there was one of your clinicians that worked at Solceri and someone else and Daniel mentoring all of us a little bit on that approach. So can you share a little bit, I guess, about that approach and maybe the, um, the brain of Stan analogy that you use in the book? Yeah, this is Daniel's work is this complex system science approach to brain health, right? So if we take any complex system, imbalance is going to cause dysregulation. And in the case of the brain disease, uh, including neurodegenerative diseases, so if our goal is balance, what does that mean? Well, when we define imbalance, it's too much, too little, in the wrong place or at the wrong time. Balance is going to be the right amounts in the right places at the right time. And so you could apply this to government systems or financial systems, right? And this is what a lot of Daniel's work is, is when, when you have a complex system, how do we create balance and regulation? How do we, this homeodynamic space where we're kind of coming back to the midline, right? And we're, but we're fluctuating up and down. Things have rhythms to them. And so when we say balance, it's like, okay, of what, right? Is it amyloid plaque that we're talking about? Or is it inflammation that we're talking about? And Daniel argues, and, and I am in full agreement with him, and that's why it's in the book, is that we want to go above that. What are the causal level or primary drivers? And we can create a list of six primary drivers, or we call them the six components of brain health. And with, when they are in balance, you, ha you get brain health, you get regulation in that system, you get cellular health, everything functions. And when they're out of balance, that's when we le it leads to disease of one sort or another. So the categories are toxins, nutrients, stressors, structure, signaling, and infections. I know that can feel like a lot for people often, but instead of getting overwhelmed, I just uh, bear with us. We're going to dig into some of them. But also know that we can systematically go through these. And many of them, you might just check that box. You might be like, okay, I've got this stressor piece figured out. I meditate. I, I exercise enough. My life is fulfilling and purposeful and my re relationships are great. So you can just check that box. But maybe there's a toxic piece that is big for you. Or maybe there's a structural piece. You have molecular structure. Your, your genetics are high, uh, put you at risk for de developing dementia or maybe you've had traumatic brain injuries, 
or maybe you have a bunch of these things, right? They're not mutually exclusive. So this is our framework that we use to evaluate what might be driving this for different people. Because it, although a lot of people, and this I think is what the conventional medical system has missed, is that although we all might arrive at a diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's, most people have taken very different paths to get there. And so that's what we want to understand about the individual is how did you arrive at this diagnosis? And if we can identify for, with a precision medicine individualized model, if we can identify how you got there, we might be able to go back down that path in the opposite direction towards full neurofunction. And the term in complex system science is history dependence. So all complex systems are dependent on the history, like what shaped them to get to where they are, right? So that's a you know, super important approach to dealing with something as complex as the brain. And I know one of the things I remember reading Dr. Dale Bredesen's original study when he wrote up the 10 cases, and a big part of the idea is, you know, by the time a brain has something like dementia, there's a lot of different systems within the brain that are imbalanced. And it probably doesn't make sense just to do one thing, like one molecule, one drug, one target, that we want to take a comprehensive approach. And that was embedded in his original 10 cases. And it's ultimately what you do and what your book is about. And I think that brain of stand analogy came from him, right? Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, this is Dr. Bredesen's analogy. So if you think of the brain as a country, my brain is done. If your brain is at war, if you're defending or attacking toxins, infections, then your resources, so that nutrient balance, right? If we're, if we're out of balance, we've got too many toxins, we've got too many infections in the brain. Now our resources are being drained. So you can think of any country at war, right? Your resources are going into fighting and defending. It doesn't make sense to spend resources at that point on building infrastructure. If you're a country at war, you're not building roads and schools. They might get bombed, right? They might get destroyed. And so you want all of your resources going towards fighting and resolving whatever the insult is, right? Getting rid of that, resolving it. And then you want to focus on repairing and rebuilding. Now, you know, there's nuance to this. Of course, we can do some repair and support and regenerative work while we're resolving the toxins and, and infections. But it's often where we'll start. Because we want to be aware of, of resource, right? Our brain is only 2% of body weight, but uses 20% of energy expenditure every day. And so as we go through that process, you know, methyl B12 is going to be taken up by just day-to-day -day metabolic activity in the brain. But we're going to use even more of it if we've got excess mercury or mold toxicity or if we're trying to fight an infection. Same with glutathione, with other nutrients that are really important to cognitive function. So we need to have potentially more resources, at least temporarily, while we resolve those things. And so I love Dr. Bredesen's analogies. He has a ton of them, but that's one of my, my absolute favorites because I think it clicks for people. We get it. We get that if we, we don't want to be spread so thin that we're trying to regenerate and grow new brain cells at the same time as trying to resolve a bunch of things that we have to fight and defend against. I know my simple analogies has always been what you just said, right? Like, you know, what are the obstacles to cure? Like, and which ones are the easiest ones or the most actionable for that person? And what are the, the resources that can be added in? And that combination, if you do both of those things, generally you move things in a better direction, which is as you started off, right? That, that's the goal, right? There's, no matter where our brain is currently, we can generally move it in a better direction if it's not performing optimally. And so with that, I want to shift gears and talk about some of the approaches that you do. And I'll just start with diet. And there's a lot. So for listeners, the, each chapter has just a wealth of potential things you can do. But one that I know you're a big proponent of, and I've mentioned both in your study write-up and in the book, is getting people into ketosis. Yeah. So the, that's the longest chapter because this is where we get the most questions. So this is often very challenging for people. But I'm sure, I know a lot of NeuroHacker listeners have probably all, already toyed with this. And if you've never actually gotten into ketosis, this is your push. Like, go for it. D commit and, and do it because it's such an interesting experiment for anyone to notice how they feel in ketosis versus glycolysis when you're burning fat for fuel instead of sugar for fuel. And although I'm a huge proponent of keto, I do think that it's the best diet for healing the brain. And for those who are suffering with cognitive decline, I'll usually recommend that they get into ketosis for three to six months. And then after that, go back and forth between either a paleo diet or a plant-based diet. 
Dr. Dean Ornish published a paper recently, just at the beginning of June of 2024, and it was the first randomized control trial to show the effects of an intensive lifestyle intervention. And the conclusions that they drew were that comprehensive lifestyle changes may significantly improve cognition and function after just five months in many patients with mild cognitive impairment or early dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. So this was really exciting. And the reason I bring it up as we talk about diet is because they didn't use ketosis. They used a vegan diet. Now, I think the overarching dietary recommendation I would make if you could do anything, it would be eliminate processed sugar completely and eliminate processed foods, really, especially highly processed foods, ultra processed foods. Sometimes you'll hear them called. But carbohydrates that are ultra processed, like even breads and pastas and cakes and cookies, all this stuff, it's so it's toxic to our bodies. It's toxic to our brain. And as much as we can eliminate that as possible, make those just an exception so rarely, that is going to be beneficial for our health long term. I love keto and I'm not I'm not moving away from that love of keto. Even personally, I've noticed that I feel cognitively clear. I feel better when I'm in ketosis. I have more energy. I feel more articulate. I think that we'll find that that is important and something that we should, it's an ancestral diet, right? Our bodies are designed to go back and forth and in and out of ketosis, but I don't think you have to be keto. I also don't think you have to be vegan to get the, these brain healthy benefits of these lifestyle interventions. I suspect that what we'll see is the best diet is going back and forth between them. Well, and the other thing that I believe too, is that Ron Smith was a naturopathic doctor from Connecticut that when I was in naturopathic school at what's now Sonoran College of Naturopathic Medicine, it was Southwest College back in the day, so I still call it SCNMM. So he would have been like a paleo guy way before paleo was a thing. His book was Native Nutrition for listeners. But one of the big things I remember him saying, and he was a hardcore diet guy. Like I remember meeting some of his classmates when he was at National College of Naturopathic Medicine saying, oh, he came in this and then he became a macrobiotic. And then he, when he went to wheatgrass, he would bring the whole flat in to the classes. But what he said that really stuck was that there can be a big difference between a diet that takes someone from unhealthy back to healthy and one that keeps them there. Right. And so, you know, I think diet often gets very tribal and people get attached to whatever it was that moved them from unhealthy to healthy. And I've always been more of a proponent, no, like focus on the healthy bit. Like there's, and as you put it out in the book, like once your brain starts to do energetically better by having been in ketosis for three to six months, then there's more flexibility for not having to do that every day, every day. So I think the only thing I would pass on to our listeners is that don't get so dogmatic that this is the way. It's probably a way. And as Dr. Heather just mentioned, there, there might be other ways <laughs> as well. Yeah. I, I think the the ancestral diet piece, I am a huge proponent of, right? I love, we are designed for whole foods, not processed foods, which are the majority of what people eat these days. And I, I think it's important that that doesn't get missed. It's like the real diet, the best dietary advice is avoid processed foods. <laughs> processed foods are associated with the chronic diseases of aging, just hands down. There's no question about it. They're highly profitable, highly palatable. They're cheap, right? They're easy to come by. They're, it's all convenience, but they are terrible for our health. And then when we think about these ancestral diets, like what are we designed to eat? What are we designed to process, designed to assimilate, designed to like get our, our cells running? The consistent thing about ancestral diets was inconsistency. So I often see that people really benefit from a change in their diet, from going into ketosis, and then maybe even from going vegan, going plant-based, or maybe going carnivore, and then maybe going raw, right? There's lots of different ways to do this, but that delta, it's the change where I often see people get the benefit. And to your point, right, it's like there's a very different diet that gets you healthy and then the one that keeps you healthy. And I think the one that keeps you healthy includes variety, eating with the seasons, and then knowing that, you know, for women who are postmenopausal versus when they're cycling, they, very different diets might be most beneficial in those different seasons of life. And the same goes for men, I think, as well. Right? As we age, as for pregnant moms, we're going to need a different diet than a postmenopausal woman. And so keeping that openness and that curiosity, that awareness around what's going to be best for me at this phase of life, it might be different from what's been best for me for the past 10 years. 
the continuous glucose monitors, I don't know if you want to go down this rabbit hole real quick, but yeah, sure. It's just one of these really fun things. I know a couple of the companies that make CGMs right now, you have to have a prescription to get them. Although you can ask your provider to send you one to Costco using the good RX prescription, you can get one for about $63. It's actually exactly $63. And they come in a pack of three. So it costs a little over $180. But I do this a lot with patients, pretty much everybody coming in these days, we're getting them a CGM as fast as they're willing to do it. And I, I recommend that people do it with their partner, whoever they're living with, you know, if you've got an adult child or a caregiver or somebody or a, a husband or wife or spouse, whatever works for you. But it's really fascinating because what you'll see are the differences between individuals and also start to pick on, on things like stress, sleep deprivation, exercise. Those impact our blood sugar as much as food almost, right? They're going to have these big impacts on what's happening with our cortisol and our blood sugar. And although we're not measuring cortisol, the cortisol has an effect on blood sugar that's outside of what we're deciding to eat. And it's just one of these um, exercises, wearing a, a continuous glucose monitor, which you have to have a prescription for now. But the point of my story there was soon, I don't know exactly what the timeline is, but those are going to be available over the counter. And I hope for even less, I hope that there will be a, a price break on those. This is one of the most educational things I have personally ever done to learn about my own metabolism and and what helps support health for me. I mean, just wild how much you've learned. I don't know if you've had personal experiences or if you've heard stories, but I, I just think everyone should get a CGM. I think of everything in a sense of learning, right? So the way we learn is we interact with the world, like we move fundamentally, right? Our senses then take in feedback and then our brain figures it out. Like learning to me is always about doing and getting feedback from the doing and repetition, right? That Because learning takes repetition. And CGM is one way to get a new channel of feedback that we can't get without that, right? So I'm like always 100% in favor of any feedback <laughs> loop that can be created. So I love it. Yeah, I'm imagining the day where we can get cortisol and we can get ketones and we can get a bunch of other things on that continuous monitor. Yeah. So um, I want to shift away from diet. Like you said, it's the largest chapter and there's just so much. It's rich for listeners on um, that chapter alone. But I want to shift to exercise just quickly. And one of the themes in the book is that when we do things, we want to do them in ways that, that engage the brain as well. So like in the, the chapter on exercise, one of my takeaways is we want to do probably more intense exercise than we're currently doing if we're struggling, but we want to do it in ways that engage the brain. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, general exercise recommendations, and you will have heard this other places, but you want about 200 minutes a day. And you'll see those recommendations vary from 150 minutes to 300 minutes per week. Excuse me, I said per day. That's a lot of exercise per day. But 200 minutes per week is what our target is and some combination of strength and aerobic. So one of the approaches to exercise specific for Alzheimer's and cognitive function that many people haven't heard of is dual task exercises. So dual D-U-A-L is in two things at once. And this is engaging cognitively at the same time that we engage physically. And so if you can take those 200 minutes and some fraction of that at least becomes dual task where you're doing these two things simultaneously and you can be doing a HIIT workout where you're getting strength and aerobic and cognitive all at the same time. That would be wonderful, very efficient. Or it might mean walking and talking, right? This is a simplest form of dual task exercise where we're, we're engaging physically and we're staying engaged cognitively. I think for our listeners here, you want to be at about 75%, right? So not so extremely challenging that you're giving up either physically or cognitively and not so unengaging, right? That you're just giving up because you're not interested, you're bored, right? So walking and talking is going to be too little for the vast majority of people listening to this podcast. What you're probably going to think of is, oh, can I go for a run and listen to an engaging podcast? And this is often like what I will do, right? But I have to stop it. I have to like pause Andrew Huberman or Peter Atia and go like, okay, what did I just learn? And then if it's socially appropriate, I'll like say it out loud, right? And and what did I really, so that it really cements in my brain because that's where learning takes place, right? Is if we were to almost teach it, uh, like see one, do one, teach one, this is part of accelerating the learning process. So we want to make sure that we're not just passively absorbing a podcast, right? And thinking about our to-do list, but we're really actually present. So that typically means 
is somewhere in that like 75, 80% of cognitive engagement. Again, it's not so hard that we give up, but it's not so easy we're checked out. Yeah, that idea of focus, I remember, I think we blogged about this at one point on quietlife.com, but background was a journalist had approached our head of marketing and said, oh, can I interview someone on your team about exercising while in the, like, in the zone, focused, first checked out. And their hypothesis was there would be big advantages of each. And th- not that there's no advantages to being checked out, but what you would find is that the more in the zone you are, the more focused when you're exercising on what you're doing, the more gains you'll make quicker. Right? So one of the studies I remember pointing to at the time was one where they had people doing a biceps curling exercise. And in one group, they had them just watching, I think it was a video monitor in the background. So they were somewhat checked out and they got about 6% stronger. But the people that focused on their muscle movement while they were doing the muscle movement got like 35% stronger, right? So huge difference there, right? And I think I'm not perfect at it, but I, I do multiple walks around my block here in Oceanside by the beach a day to just take a break from working. And my goal in those walks is not to just ruminate, like have my brain wandering. It's to pay attention to the sound of the ocean, birds chirping, the wind, like focus, but on something different than my brain had been focused on. Um, Plus walk. So do both. It sounds like what you were looking at was for performance enhancement from a physical perspective, right? And we also see that the opposite is true. So you get a performance enhancements from a cognitive perspective as well when you do this. So if the goal is to reverse dementia, right, or to optimize cognitive function, you get gains there as well. Basically, you get, we're potentiating the time that you spend exercising, you get more potential improvement out of it when you engage cognitively. And a lot of this work was done at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute. We are partnering with them a bit more formally lately. It's run by David Merrill and Sarah McEwen has published a bit She's no longer there, but Ryan Glatt has taken over for her and they have a brain gym where they see, I think they see more Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's patients than any other clinic in all of California. So they have a huge amount of volume there in Santa Monica and take a, a bunch of patients through this brain gym and have been able to study and publish around this dual task exercise uh, approach. And you'll see it used for traumatic brain injuries, for Parkinson's, for um, stroke, post-stroke. And just the improvements, you can you can accelerate all of that when you're doing both of these things together. There was another area you talked about, I think it was cognitive leisure activities, which I guess can overlap with exercise a bit. But can you share a bit about that? Yeah, you know, one of my favorite things that I've learned on this journey is that it's important for whatever you're engaged in to be fun. And this is like a duh moment, right? I'm like, of course, it's important. But I also hear so many patients will come in and be like, well, there's this thing online and I kind of hate it. It's this chore and I try to do it for 30 minutes every day, but I don't like it. And, you know, my husband's always giving me a hard time that I don't do enough of it. And I'm like, stop, 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 stop. No, (laughs) that is not going to help your, or it might marginally help your brain get better, right? I don't want to totally just count those things. If you enjoy, if you enjoy computer games, by all means, do them. But if you feel like it's a chore to get on, to to log into something and play some computer game that's supposed to help your brain, do something else. Go find another fun activity that feels engaging. There was a woman I was talking to a, a week or so ago, a patient who came in. She's doing phenomenally well. She's getting better. And she used to host parties. She loved hosting parties. And it got to be too much. So her husband would basically, her husband and her daughters would basically plan them for her, right? She would still have, kind of host the party, but she wasn't involved in, set, you know, picking the date and sending out invitations and figuring out what food and decorations and stuff like that. And so we decided together, let's give her that back. She's doing better. She might make a few mistakes, but that's what she loves to do. She likes planning her outfit and coordinating with everyone and calling the neighbors and she loves celebrating. So let's give her basically more executive function tasks, right? The planning and execution of a party. Like, why not, right? And there have been other people where we've had similar conversations and we come up with really fun things. And what's important about it being fun is when we all learn better when we're having fun, it reduces the stress. We know that increasing cortisol, we don't remember as well. This is why torture doesn't work, right? When we're under stress, many of us can relate to feeling under stress and we can't remember something or we forget things or 
public speaking, right? That that stage fright experience. If I'm under a lot of stress, very high pressure, everything is, is wiped from my mind. I can't remember. So these are just some examples that I, I hope that people can can kind of relate to. And then it's like, okay, we can extrapolate. If we're having a good time, one, we're going to be more likely to do it, right? If you feel like you have to force yourself to do this brain game, you're not less, you're more likely to skip it. You're It's more likely to fall out of the routine. But when we look forward to going out to play pickleball with our friends, which is socially engaging, plus there's skills and hand-eye coordination, and maybe there's strategy involved, and we're getting that physical engagement, and we're getting vitamin D from the sun, when we can look forward to something, we're more likely to keep it in the routine. Long after you listen to this podcast or read a book or anything like that, it's going to stick with us and become part of our life, maybe even part of our identity. And that is when we see that we get more benefit. Plain bridge. And if you look forward to playing bridge, there's strategy and, and cognitive engagement and social engagement, then play bridge. Don't sign up for the next brain game online. It was such an important message. I remember there was one point, it was when I was in naturopathic school, and so my time was pretty maxed out. I also worked at a, a food co-op a couple of nights a week. But at the time I taught yoga, I was trying to do Tai Chi. Yeah, I had a guitar, so I would mess around with that. And I had all these good things that had just grown over time to do, you know, cook my own meals. And I remember waking up one morning and just feeling like, like just looking at all the things I had to do in my leisure time, never mind go to school and be completely overwhelmed and just deciding at that point, like you know, these things are supposed to serve me, not the other way around. And so I think it's important that we find the things that are the best fit. But as you pointed out, right, that are challenging our brains, our brain in new ways, because it wants to learn. It wants to socialize, right? Those are huge parts of how our brain works. It wants to engage with movement, you know, because uh, that visual part of our brain, the, the sensory part that moves through space. So if we can find things that we love and that hit more than one of those areas, the brain is going to be soaking it up. So the next thing I wanted to touch on was just environment. And the thing I put down was declutter as many areas as you can. I know a big part of it's on improving the environment and toxins, but I love that part as well. Yeah, you know, the brain, I think we can, again, this is one of those things we can relate to kind of those dumb moments of like, obviously, this helps me, but we don't always take action. I, I have those spots in my house where for months, there will be some, in fact, right now, there's a baby gift for someone that's been there for like four weeks, and I don't even see it anymore, right? I just walk by it, and I just don't even see it. I almost have to, I don't know how we're going to get that. Maybe now that I've said it to you, Greg, I'll finally get that to the recipient. It's just those things that stack up around us, and particularly for older folks who have lived in their homes for decades, right? They haven't moved, raised kids there. There's Some things are meaningful. Some things are just like the pile that needs to be returned to the store. But clutter can tend to build up, and we're not aware of it. But it's almost like this this irritant on the nervous system. It's a to-do list, but it's not written down. It doesn't get checked off. It just almost sits there in the background. It's background noise, but it's still irritating. And you can feel it when you finally get a surface cleaned off. It's like, oh, okay. And now once you start doing that to more and more of your home, you have this sense of like, uh, there's an opening to take on more because there's not this constant to-do list kind of in your subconscious every time you look around the space you inhabit. And so that's the invitation there. And for many people, decluttering, it can be very emotional. It, and so it's not about taking you know, the weekends to do all of it at once. It's really about thinking, okay, one surface at a time. Can I get some things off the kitchen cabinet or the kitchen counter so that it's not in my visual field? When we think through environment, I think through the senses. What can I hear? What can I see? What can I smell? What do I feel? And then, of course, in the kitchen, what am I tasting? But when you think through the this, what's coming in, right? What's coming, like you you were talking about this, this feedback and, and what we're getting in from the environment. If there's a lot of clutter in the environment, it's distracting. It's irritating and distracting. And so when we can take a moment, be mindful, eliminate that clutter, we open up more space cognitively. Well, I think that's, like one of the things I used to focus on when I worked with patients was what I would refer to as the unresolved, right? We, we all typically have that, right? Like there's some things maybe low level, like, oh, I have these shoes, should I give them to Goodwill or what should I do with them? Or these clothes that I don't wear, like, should I put them on eBay or, or maybe I'll lose weight and wear them again? 
So those are, you know, minor, but like big unresolved or a whole bunch of the little ones stacked together would just cut in to someone's health is how it generally seemed. And certainly their ability to tackle new things and to take on new and better habits if their bandwidth was already consumed with a lot of these unresolves. And so the last thing I wanted to shift to was sleep. And I know one of the analogies was the sleep bus, which I know I, I've used that analogy in my book way back. That is yours. You own that analogy. Yeah. So can you share that analogy with the listeners? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, this it, this totally belongs to you, Greg. So correct me. Jump in if I'm not sharing it cur- the way that you intended. But the way I understood it was like if a sleep bus arrives in the evening and you don't get on it, it, so you start feeling sleepy. If you don't take that signal to go to bed, you don't know when the next sleep bus is going to show up. And so often what people will experience is like a second wind. And then now you're entering that area where you're going to get sleep deprivation because maybe you have to be up for something in the morning or maybe you have struggled to sleep after the sun comes up. But now we're we're compressing that sleep window. And most people get more benefit from those hours of sleep before midnight. And so if we Wait, if we don't get on that first bus, we get that second wind. And then now we're waiting, waiting, waiting for the second sleep bus to show up. We're lying in bed, unable to fall asleep. We really start to accumulate sleep deprivation. And we know that one night of sleep deprivation can lead to an increase, a measurable increase in amyloid in the cerebral spinal fluid if even people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. So over decades, this is very significant. So we want to make sure that we are, when we get sleepy, we respond to that signal and we get rest. Our brain is dependent on it. This is actually absolutely crucial to brain health. Well, you got the analogy right. So yeah, so like the uh, this is just my experience going way back is that people would come in and say, oh, like I have trouble falling asleep. And the the way I understand sleep would be that idea like, oh, well, Sleep comes like a bus. It pulls into the station. You know, as you mentioned, we're sleepy. Like it's our job then to stop what we're doing and get on the bus before it leaves without us, because it's not going to come again for maybe another you know seventy or ninety minutes, right? So if in between those we decide to go to sleep, of course we're going to lie awake for thirty-five or forty minutes because we're waiting for the next sleep bus. Where if you time it right, usually you can get on and and fall asleep earlier. And it's my goal always to, is to catch the sleep bus when it comes early rather than a later one. So yeah. And then the other thing I really jotted down was how much you emphasize putting a bubble around that three hour window before the sleep bus would normally come. Because once we, you start getting on it, my experience is it more or less comes the same time most nights. So you can have a good predictive sense of when it might be coming. Yeah, I think the more consistent we are with getting to sleep around the same time every night, right? So if your bedtime is 9.30 and you're getting into bed between 9.15 and 9.45, you're going to get more efficient, better sleep. If you are going to bed at 11 p.m. one night and 8 p.m. the next night and 2 a.m. the next night and flying between time zones, your sleep becomes unpredictable, right? Your body doesn't know how to predict when you're going to be able to sleep. And so you're not getting that sleepy signal will be wonky. And I think that our sleep becomes much less efficient. We're not getting as much deep sleep, enough REM sleep. We need enough sleep. So seven hours minimum, 90 minutes of REM is what we would aim for in an hour of deep. Now, don't let those numbers keep you from sleeping at night. Like those are just general recommendations. But getting about that, is kind of the minimum that we want for brain health because during REM sleep, it's when we're consolidating memories. It's when we're taking that emotional edge off of whatever we've experienced so that we don't have a cortisol spike the next day when we remember that conversation from yesterday. Deep sleep is when we're rinsing that lymphatic system is rinsing toxins out of the brain, including amyloid. And so if we skip either of those, we don't have that restful, recovered sleep that we need to keep our brain healthy and active. And again, something so many of us can relate to from jet lag or from staying up all night to study or whatever it is, for whatever reason, if we have experienced sleep deprivation, our brain doesn't work as well as when we're really fully rested. Going back to the late 90s, I just had, I even had doctor friends at the time like, oh, I only need four hours of sleep or five hours of sleep. You know, now I, you know, like smart biohackers and health people are like, no, no, I, I like rock on my sleep. <laughs> and I emphasize it. So yeah, sleep, is still, I think, underrated for the general public. 
I need to plug treating sleep apnea really quickly. Sure. Because I think, especially in my clinical practice, I have two women who have had miraculous improvements in their cognition. And both of them nearly doubled that cognitive score. Their families are like, thank you, my mom is back. You know, just really profound benefits. And both of them had untreated sleep apnea. And so once we identified it and treated it, made a world of difference for their cognition. They started getting that REM sleep and that deep sleep and enough sleep, and they weren't hypoxic. They weren't starving their brain of oxygen, essentially creating mild brain damage each night. And so that, I mean, just my clinical experience with that is that I think that this is probably a reflective of what's happening in the population, right? There's probably a bunch of Alzheimer's out there that is untreated sleep apnea. And so if you are a loved one, I, if you know you have sleep apnea and you already have the mouth guard or the CPAP, start wearing it tonight. If you if you know you have mild sleep apnea, maybe t- somebody told you it wasn't a big deal, start mouth taping tonight. And if you have any inkling that you might have sleep apnea or someone you know or love might have sleep apnea, get them tested. Do the work that it takes to get the appointment, get that taken care of, get that treated. And then the other category of people is the the person who like is not the typical, right? If you have any cognitive impairment. So both of these women, they were thin. They went into the sleep study and somebody told one of them, you don't look like someone with sleep apnea. And lo and behold, she had severe obstructive sleep apnea. So if you have any cognitive impairment, test your sleep, at least rule it out. You don't have to be overweight and male and snoring to have obstructive sleep apnea and have it be impacting your brain negatively. So I wish everybody could, it kind of like the CGM, it's like if everyone could get tested for sleep apnea, we would have less chronic disease because it affects your cardiovascular health and of course your brain health. Such a good tip. There's a, a couple apps that you can use that will record your sleep. And since it's listening to your sleep, it's going to at least attempt to let you know, it, given that input, whether you're in and out of some kind of sleep disordered breathing. So the last area I wanted to touch on just was supplements. One of the areas I know was in your study that you also use in practice, and there was a lot to the chapter, but seven specific, I think, categories of things is what I jotted down. But one was nootropics, which, you know, at Qualia, we're a huge fan of. Another two were probiotics and digestive enzymes, which Qualia Symbiotic covers those. So maybe just I wanted to get your thoughts, you know, and maybe a, a case or two where you've, you know, what you've seen when people supplement yeah, so we used QualiaMind in the clinical trial that we did. Uh, that was the nootropic formula that we used. And I put pretty much everyone who comes in with cognitive decline on QualiaMind right out of the gate. And then for those suffering with fatigue as well, Qualia Life um, is another product that I'm a big fan of. So supplementation can be one of these easy wins. Whenever people are trying to get started and they feel overwhelmed, supplementing, just swallowing some pills is pretty simple, right? Compared to changing your diet, changing your sleep habits, changing your exercise routine, just creating a little bit more nutrient resource in our bodies can be that thing that helps us to finally get the sleep that we need, right? Because I'll I'll have this sleep conversation with people and they'll be like, I know, I get it. I know I need sleep for my brain, but I can't sleep. And it's like, okay, if we can get you the right formula, sometimes all of a sudden now you're sleeping Now that you're waking up rested, you can make better dietary decisions. You have the energy to reach out to that friend to go for a walk. All of a sudden, you just have more resource generally. And so supplements are an easy place to start. And I think quality of mind is one of those ones where this can be game changing for people, right? To finally feel like they have focus and clarity. They sleep better at night. I experience that when I take quality of mind, I'll sleep better in the night, even though it's a bit stimulating during the day. I actually get... It's the metabolism of the neurotransmitters and the caffeine takes place so that I can have that wind down. So generally what we're trying to do is figure out what that person needs, but places to start, quality of mind, fish oils, vitamin D. If you are not on a blood thinner, then you can also take vitamin D with K2, D3 with K2. That's great for bones, but K2 also has receptor sites in the brain. And then a probiotic gut brain connection. We tend to use a probiotic. Sometimes enzymes will also, you know, if someone has high levels of homocysteine, which is quite common, we'll add methylated B vitamins, B6, 9, and 12. And typically we'll use betaine or trimethylglycine as a methyl donor. And then outside of that, we're really looking like, okay, does this person have a lot of inflammation? Do they have infectious burden? Do they have toxic burden? 
Do they have particular nutrient deficiencies like say CoQ10 or maybe there's a nutrient excess like cholesterol or blood sugar? And then we'll be more precise about how we use the supplements to resolve an issue. But long term, most people with cognitive decline or if they're looking to optimize cognitive function, a nootropic stack and then the fish oils and vitamin D, K and maybe a probiotic, magnesium. Yeah, magnesium's I think super like well used and still underrated at the same time. Essential fats, I think, well, and the lipid types of things like the D and the K, right? Because the, our membranes on all of our neurons are made from lipids, and there's something called the membrane theory of aging, or the membrane pacemaker theory of aging. But the general idea is that's you know part of the reason we age the way we do, or at a faster or slower rate, is because our membranes and you know how the quality of them. So all these fat soluble nutrients, which again, come from, you'll get more of those if you're eating a high quality keto based diet. Choline, I mean, eggs, right? phosphatidylcholine and acetylcholine is in quality of mind, right? Just having a robust amount of choline, not only for acetylcholine, but for membranes is super important. Phosphatidylserine. Yeah. These are all important components for brain health. And I like to think of supplements are supplemental, right? <laughs> by definition, uh, by name. And so that great healthy diet that's full of good high quality fats, lots of nutrients from vegetables and just making sure that you're keeping out those processed empty calories, keeping those out. Great. Harding, the one thing I just wanted to point to, we both have a connection to Hawaii, me in a more distant part of my life than you. But in the caregiver chapter, you point out the Hawaiian prayer, the ho Ho'oponopono. And it just, it stuck out because I listened to that song by the Emmett sisters almost every day to start my day. And and the, the translation for listeners is, is something along the lines of, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. you know, and the, the words that go with the Emmett sisters song anyways, to me are just a great reminder to start off my day to be thankful for some of the things maybe that occur during the day that aren't exactly how I want it and, you know, to forgive myself and to forgive others. So I just wanted to share with the audience, one, how much I love that Hawaiian prayer, the song, and to thank you for putting it in your book or mentioning it in your book. Yeah, it's been profound for so many people. As we age, we collect relationships and stressors and issues and traumas and the ability to let those go, to find forgiveness so that they're no longer, again, it's that attacking and defend mode, right? What can we do to release, to resolve, to get up and over that? And sometimes it's not toxins or infections that we're attacking and defending. It's it's our loved ones, right? And so how can we fully resolve that so that we can create more resource, right? So we can, we can stop sending our energy towards being angry or bitter or unresolved, and recapture that, reclaim that, and use it for regeneration, healing, and growth. And that's a big part of that. It's also uh, for care partners, for caregivers. Caregiving increases people's risk of developing dementia by anywhere from two and a half to six times. And so really taking seriously, if you are in a caregiving role or if you know someone in a caregiving role, that you're protective of your brain health by doing many of these things, taking these strategies and putting them to work for you, not just the person you're caring for. And I think that whole Ho'oponopono prayer is, I've just watched it be so profound in that caregiving relationship so much to reduce the angst and the strife and the grief and the guilt and increase the joy and the connection. And so that that's where it's being offered from. Great. Well, and I know when, at least when I listen to the Emmett sisters version of Ho'oponopono, I, the way I hear it, right, which is just my way of hearing it, but I'm sure it would be different. The, the beginning part of that song, I hear it, me being in a relationship with someone else and them maybe triggering me, me triggering them, but us getting to that space of I'm sorry and forgiveness and love. And then the latter part, I hear it, me forgiving myself. Yeah. And, and I think both are so important. So I, I see a, a lovely smile. So and a nodding along if the audience have a, a chance to see see your reaction. Yeah, that is many people's experience. It becomes more about the relationship with ourselves as you navigate uh, that forgiveness path. Great. Well, thank you again, Heather, for being with us. And for listeners, again, Heather's new book is Reversing Alzheimer's, and it's an invaluable book. I loved it. I 
think I was the second person to write a review on Goodreads about it. So I almost never write a review on Goodreads and really felt just compelled that I wanted to share how much I enjoyed the book with others. Greg, it's always a pleasure, always a privilege to see you and have a chat with you. And thank you so, so, so much for your support of the book and getting the word out about what's possible for those suffering with Alzheimer's and dementia. My pleasure. This podcast is for informational purposes only. The podcast is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. You should not use the information on the podcast for diagnosing or treating a health problem or disease, or prescribing any medication or other treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider before taking any medication or nutritional, herbal, or homeopathic supplement, and with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this or any other podcast. Reliance on the podcast is solely at your own risk. Information provided on the podcast does not create a doctor-patient relationship between you and any of the health professionals affiliated with our podcast. Information and statements regarding dietary supplements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to therein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician. 